Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. My name is Tuesday Raytano and I'm the moderator for this session, which is an overview of the uh, global maritime crime environment. I have a very illustrious panel of heroes with us this evening. These uh, two of these three uncomplaining gentlemen did not mention throughout the entire conference process that they would be doing this after midnight. So uh, we will probably not need to, but nonetheless be <laughs> very understanding of uh, those who are fatigued, which I'm afraid it does also include myself since I'm now on the morning after the night before. Um, I hope, and I see a number of familiar faces from other sessions. So thank you for those of you who are joining us in the second half of the 20 hour organized crime bonanza. Um, most of you know, I think the protocols for the discussion so far, but for anybody who's new, I'll just quickly run over them again before I turn it over to the panel. We are Zooming. We're Zooming at a relatively, uh, with a relatively large group. So we'll ask you to please keep your microphones off and on mute. As hosts, we can actually control that. So if, if for any reason you do want to make a comment and you're on mute and you can't get off mute, please just raise a hand. Um, the conference is completely public. It is not under Chatham House rules. So everything here can be um, tweeted, noted and shared with attribution. But we are asking everyone to please not share the live link to the session itself in your social media because we've had some interesting visitors every time that has happened. Um, some more interesting than others, shall we say. So overall, um, the goal is to keep the conversation, to be to dynamically have an opportunity to engage with all of the panel. So we do encourage it, but at the same time, we want to keep our uh, conversations within the panel, of, uh, the group of experts that we have here today, rather than uh, surprise visitors. Um, we will begin with a series of presentations. We have three speakers. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on introductions because it was all on the website ahead of time but we have Carsten Voss Hessling, who's giving us an overview of maritime crime trends and dynamics at the moment in the Asia region. Dirk Siebels, who's doing the same for Africa and Christian Ehrlich, who's doing the same for the Gulf of Mexico. So we really are spanning the um, ocean, the oceans and the seas in full across the globe. And really, I mean, I know the work of these three gentlemen well, so I know that they will have very interesting insights to share with you. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn over to Dirk for a little introduction and then on to the panel. Thank you, Tuesday, and good morning, good afternoon and everything and welcome everybody to this panel. Um, just very quickly about how this panel came together. So um, the story behind it is really quite simple. So going back to my own PhD, I still have some academic side interests and side projects, but my day job is at Risk Intelligence and we provide security related advice to mainly maritime clients. So that includes shipping companies and insurers, but also government agencies, navies, etc. So as you can imagine, they have a pretty extremely actually different perspective on things. Um, as an analyst, my day job, and I think many people can relate to that, my day job is to know very much about very little. And um, I think that will become quite clear in my presentation. Um, so I thought it's a nice idea to bring together other people with the same kind of nerdy interest in, in this kind of very niche topic, um, but about other parts of the world. So um, this being a global initiative conference, of course, uh, it makes sense to look at a pretty broad perspective of maritime security issues, um, because most headlines and academic articles and all that are really concerned with piracy, which is the sexy and interesting topic. So we are looking at um, a more comprehensive perspective because piracy of course doesn't happen in a vacuum and uh, people who attack ships are pretty likely to be involved in other dodgy activities as well as my fellow speakers will attribute to us I think um, and that's really the very short version um, so I'll let you be the judge and I'll head back to Tuesday for moderation thank you very much Thank you so much, Dirk. That's very helpful and very kind. We do indeed try and maintain a global environment. And I think the dynamics in the maritime space are often too, too restricted, both geographically and in forms of crime. And so this is a really nice opportunity to think more broadly about maritime threats. So with no further ado, Carsten von Hessling, a long partner in crime of ours. Um, he's published a number of, uh, actually two very interesting reports with the GI, which I would encourage you all to 
uh, check out. But um, he comes from an intelligence background, specialing in human intelligence infiltration, has worked on piracy, kidnap for ransom negotiations, um, currently in process of a PhD, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, has a quite a nice documentary to his name. Carsten, the floor is yours. Good morning, good evening, thank you Tuesday. Hi Dirk, hi Christian, it's, uh, it's great to be here on this panel, even though it is well past midnight. But uh, yeah, lovely to be here and see you again and to be a part of this. Um, I'm gonna zoom through this and ultimately I reckon in under 10 minutes, but then I'd like to open the floor for questions and compare it to the other regions as well. This presentation is gonna be pretty basic. It's just me, there's no stats, no charts, no graphs. Um, and the reason is because I don't have any, I can't show you any charts, stats or graphs because this is all about the type of crime that's underreported within the region in Southeast Asia. So to begin, if we talk about maritime transnational crime, uh, the first thing that rings a bell obviously within Southeast Asia is going to be piracy. But when we think of the term piracy, we first have to ask ourselves, what does that mean? Because I find when I address piracy issues in Southeast Asia, the first thing they wanna do, when I say they, I say agencies or governments is try to define it and put me in a corner. So we can accept the fact that governments will have a certain definition of piracy. And I mean, that goes to UNCLOS or suppression of unlawful acts at sea convention. Insurance companies will have a different definition and academics might very well have one, but my favorite one to go to is what do the pirates call themselves? So from an entomological, entomological perspective, how does a pirate define themselves? And I've asked this question to pirates in Somalia, I've asked this question to pirates in the Gulf of Guinea as well as in the Caribbean. And with Southeast Asia, it's really interesting because if you suggest, are you, are you a pirate like Bajak Lao, which is Bahasa for hijacking, they look at you and go, no, 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 God, no, I don't do that. That's what the Somali pirates do. And it makes me think of um, this great story when I was uh, taking the ferry from Dumai to Bangkalis. And I was puttering on this ferry and I was meeting another pirate kingpin who is an Indonesian and he was about to give up another Indonesian but was doing some work in Malaysian waters. And we were looking at a way to capture him in Malaysian waters. And we're sitting there on this ferry. And those of you who've been on ferries in Southeast Asia, it's quite humorous because it's the air conditioning's cranked on and you're sitting there and they're playing a pirated DVD up on the main screen. And all of a sudden they're playing Captain Phillips. And I very well know Captain Phillips in the background of that case. I was part of it, but I'd never seen the movie. And I was just fascinated by the fact that I'm watching Captain Phillips on the screen and I'm sitting next to a real life pirate and we're talking about operations. And he's looking at me, he's like, why are you so distracted? And I said, oh, well, this is just interesting because we've got a pirate here and we're watching a, a film about piracy. And right away, he says, absolutely not. That's not what I do. I don't do that. What I do is black business. And so this is really interesting because black business is black in terms of oil and fuels and dirty liquids and so on. They just call this trading in this type of fuel economy and the illicit fuel trade. And so to them, it's not piracy. They aren't pirates. So they don't define themselves as pirates either. To them, this is just an organized criminal tactic whereby piracy is a tactic under the umbrella of organized crime. So it's really important to ask, how do the suspects or the pirates or whatever you wanna call them in Southeast Asia, how do they define themselves? And in this particular case, no, they're, they're business people. They're dealing in fuels, they're dealing in cigarettes, they're dealing in humans but they're not loyal pirates, as we would say, like in, in Somalia, for example, they'd be extremely loyal. So we have to remember that, you know, it, it's piracy is just a tactic in Southeast Asia. And when we talk more about maritime crime, or if we talk about the piracy umbrella, it's so much more important to talk about organized crime. When we do talk about piracy though, in Southeast Asia, we have to then break that down because I believe we have a bit of a quantity versus a quality issue because everyone likes to go to the IMB or the recap reports and be like, Southeast Asia has the most amount of pirate incidents. Well, hang on, let's look at what we've got here. So if we look right now, trending in 2020, we've got a huge influx of petty thefts, RMC robberies, call them ASRs, uh, typically if they're inside the territorial waters of a state versus outside the territorial waters because then it's legally defined as piracy. But we have a lot of these and a lot of failed 
attempts as well. Very little going on in the Malacca Strait, and we have actually quite little going on in the South China Sea as well. And those two areas have typically in previous years been active. So right now we have a lot of petty theft. And I ask myself, I'm in Alberta right now, it's minus eight outside, but the West Edmonton Mall is not very far away. So when I look at the Malacca Strait and the Singapore Strait, I ask myself, okay, what is that like? That's like a giant shopping mall. Do you have shoplifting in a shopping mall? Yeah, in a giant mall, you're probably gonna have a lot of people trying to steal a lot of little things. Is that really a big problem? Absolutely not, I'd say. It's a good distraction because what you're seeing is a lot of activity, a lot of reported incidents. You're seeing the occasional law enforcement doing an arrest, but is that really the big problem, the big money maker in the region? And no, it's not, to be frank. The other issues that we have in Southeast Asia would be kidnap for ransom in the Sulu Celibus Sea, and that's insurgent groups in the Philippines that are kidnapping individuals or uh, seafarers from vessels, but also from resorts, for example, on Sabah and Sarawak in Malaysia. And that is an, a continuous problem. It was pretty high peaking in 2016, um, and now we have a couple incidents occurring per year. Not so bad. In terms of the hijackings, and when we talk about hijackings, we can't think immediately about Somalia or the Gulf of Guinea. So in other words, in these hijackings, they're hijacking for product theft. So what they're after is the fuel and the cargo inside these product tankers, crude palm oil, marine gas oil, marine diesel oil. So unlike in Somalia, where they're going to take the crew and the vessel as they have been in the past and ransom that or Nigeria or in the Gulf of Guinea when they're specifically going after the crew. In this case, they're going specifically after the cargo. What's really interesting is violence levels are super low. When they do this, uh, we call it plus. So people like us, there's an inside job, a high likelihood of an inside job. And the best part is that the seafarers themselves, the crew members are actually never harmed. They're put on a raft, typically in a well-placed, geographically placed island where they're going to be rescued, and their passports are given to them in Ziploc bags, and they're sent on their way. The cargo is then being stolen with approximately one to two million dollars um, in profit in this heist, so to speak. So you can see this is very different than the Horn of Africa or the Gulf of Guinea. Um, it's typically an inside job. You're not having injuries occurring, and it is purely for profit and removing that cargo. So if we think about, uh, there's some major cases like the Oricum Harmony, and there have been product cases for uh, hijacking for product theft cases back in the late 90s, all the way up until three years ago reported. But right now we're not seeing any reported incidents. Does that mean that that's not happening? No, absolutely not. It's still happening. What's occurring though, is rather than going after those big product tankers that you may be seeing, or at least when I say big, I mean regional coastal tankers, they're specifically right now targeting CPO, so crude palm oil. CPO in 2007 was quite low and then the market price just surged upright. And so that became a favored commodity to hijack and then resell. As they're reselling that, they're blending it with legitimate product out in the Eastern outer port limits or the Western outer port limits or in the Java Sea. And some of that hijacked product is actually making it out to the EU markets as well. But in this particular case, what they're going after is very low risk, low flag vessels. So they're sticking to regional barges, for example, in Indonesia that they're hijacking. And prior to this, I've made some calls and uh, spoke to old informants and they're verifying it. They're still active, they're working um, and they're getting away with it. It's still an, an interesting problem. And these same groups are freelancing in organized criminal groups elsewhere when they're running gravel, they're running cigarettes, sand as well, they're running uh, wood, um, different endangered wood products, and they're also running migrants. So again, you can see how this is a maritime transnational organized crime, but you're also seeing that high value hijackings for product theft are still occurring at this time. Right now though, all these little petty incidents, the RMC robberies, the failed attacks, the petty thefts that we're seeing in the Singapore Strait is a great distraction. And I think back to 9-11 and after 9-11, there were academics that were saying, well, hang on, is this possible that terrorists could team up with pirates and they could then hijack a tanker and then set off a bomb? Why would pirates wanna do that when that is their revenue stream and keeping a low profile is what makes them money? So in this particular case right now, you've got all these petty incidents that are occurring in the Singapore Strait, 
And that's distracting and that's deflecting while they can still operate on their larger scale, making greater amounts of money in the illegal fuels and, and subsidies sector. So that's an interesting point to differentiate. And so that's where I would go back to the point of, is this a quantity thing? Do we need to be counting how many failed thefts there are or RMC robberies in areas? No, I would say that this is a quality thing. We wanna be looking at the hijackings and the bigger value cases. Eric Freecon, who some of you may have heard of, he's a great researcher. He spent a lot of time in the field there. One of my favorite uh, sayings that he always says is that a pirate never dies. They just go to sleep. So they're effectively in a, in a, in a state of hibernation waiting for the next opportunity to, to occur. We saw that when the East Asian financial crisis occurred. Uh, we saw that again in 2008 as effectively unemployment increased on the islands of Batam and Bintan, especially on the shipyards and where they're working there. Uh, you saw a surge of these types of petty thefts and robberies. But again, that's standard. That's back to that mall with the shoplifting issues that are manageable and mitigable. In terms of one of the questions to ask is, has regional enforcement in naval operations led to a decrease? I would say no, as a matter of fact. Um, I would say that it's great that you're seeing now cases where the petty thefts and the RMC robberies, you're seeing arrests, you're seeing the Malaysian Maritime Enforcement Agency continuously conducting operations. Malaysia has one of the highest conviction rates in terms of piracy cases, and that's great, and that continues you look at that and you compare it to Indonesia where you do have issues of corruption and that's affecting the prosecution rates as well as the time served rates, as well as even actually arresting because there are a lot of cases where maritime forces may very well be involved in the operations as well. So on that note, corruption is a problem and corruption continues to be a problem. And I don't just wanna always point the finger at Indonesia because you can also with Thailand, you can in some ways even with Singapore, you can also with Malaysia. So corruption continues to be a big enabler when it comes to doing these undercover piracy operations, the bigger ones for hijacking for product theft because it's not getting reported at all and it's not being enforced in that sense. The other big one I would say, and I've always been saying is face. Face plays a huge role in Southeast Asia, whether it's the fact that if you have an incident, a theft, something that's just, it's going to happen. It's like something that could happen on a highway. Singapore will then change the coordinates and just put it on the outside of their territorial waters into Indonesia's territorial waters or Malaysia's territorial waters. And that, of course, is an issue when it comes to understanding the true statistical facts of, a, of an armed sea robbery incident. Another great example is, um, is I went and did a tour and I looked at one of the Coast Guard vessels and I was taking a photo and I wanted it for a publication and they immediately said, please Photoshop out the rust. We don't wanna see any rust on this maritime vessel. Well, any vessel that's in salt water is gonna be rusting. That's just a natural factor, but it's that issue again. So face also plays a key role. So just checking how I am for time here. Uh, the question then is, right now, if you look at a map, you're seeing, yes, theft, you're seeing petty thefts and RMC robberies, but you're not seeing those hijackings. And the question then is, where have all these pirates gone, the ones who are behind this? Well, they're still there. They're still conducting hijackings. They're focusing primarily on the CPO uh, sector within Indonesia and looking mostly at the tug and barge combination or the floating barge combos alone. And also remember, remember what they call themselves. How do they define themselves? They're not pirates. They're not in this as lifers conducting piracy. They're fluid. They like to conduct other organized crime or transnational criminal tactics. So yeah, they're engaged right now in cigarette smuggling out to Australia or they're working in moving migrants between Indonesia and, and uh, Malaysia. So they're very active still, but they're just simply not labeled as stereotypical pirates. Uh, and black businesses continuing as well. So the diversity component is huge and really that links to the smuggling operations. So ultimately I'll, I'll call it there and in conclusion, um, I didn't really show you anything because there's nothing that I can show you but that doesn't necessarily mean that nothing is happening. Thanks Tuesday. <laughs> Thank you Carson, a very pithy ending indeed on a very clear depiction of things that are definitely happening. Um, Brilliant. So we will look for a similar, um, but perhaps more illustrated <laughs> description of what's going on over in uh, the on the African continent and the African littoral. Um, Derek, over to you. 
Thank you, Tuesday. Uh, I do have a, share, a presentation to share, actually, and I hope you can see that right now. Um, that's good. Um, so, but this is mainly for charts and numbers, so don't worry about a massive presentation or something. So this is just a very short intro of myself, and I mentioned most of this already. Um, I do have an interest in maritime security, which led me to my PhD, and you can see uh, the book on the right, which is uh, based on that said PhD. So if you're looking for a slightly longer and arguably slightly more boring version of this presentation, then uh, feel free to have a look and I'll uh, link you to my publisher. Um, I'm often speaking to an audience with at least some sort of background in the Gulf of Guinea or some interest because they have ships there, they have ships insured or something else. Um, I wasn't sure how much that is the case today, so I decided to put in some headlines just from recent months. This is not particularly representative, but they're all related to maritime security and specifically, of course, to piracy. So as you can probably guess from these headlines, the overall assumption is in many of these articles that the situation really seems to be spiraling out of control, more or less. Now, the reality, of course, is a bit more complicated and that very much relates to what Carsten was just talking about in Southeast Asia. So it's very similar in, in the Gulf of Guinea or of Western Central Africa. So even when we're talking only talking about piracy um, as kind of one type of organized crime at sea, then the situation has been a cause of concern for many, many years. And you can see that here um, where I have put together figures that we at Risk Intelligence have collected, as well as those by the International Maritime Bureau, which is a nonprofit reporting center financed by the shipping industry itself. And Carsten has already mentioned them. Um, there are some differences between those um, numbers, but these are mainly different methodologies and different reporting standards, etc. But that's a separate discussion. So what's obvious is the overall trend, which is actually very similar between those numbers. And in short, I would say that the Gulf of Guinea has been an area of concern, certainly for the shipping industry, for quite a long time. And the situation has not become significantly worse in the more recent past. So even going back to these headlines, you can see there's no massive escalation over the past, I don't know, 12 months or so. Um, at least that's the case when we're talking about piracy, which is arguably the best documented form of transnational organized crime at sea. So again, going back to these alarming headlines, there's more awareness, I think, um, regarding all of these problems in the region. Um, and that's both in the shipping industry, but also among maritime agencies in Western Central Africa. Um, so navies, other law enforcement agencies as well. Uh, these official statistics now actually include incidents that involve, for example, fishing vessels or, or cargo ships that are only trading within the region and they would not have been recorded just a few years ago, I think. Um, these cases, overall indicate a lack of maritime security, but they're also often linked to other illicit activities, even though they are then merely reported as piracy incidents, and that there are different reasons for that. And again, that's a longer discussion. Now, in a nutshell, that means two things. As it says here, an increase in reported attacks does not mean that piracy attacks are actually increasing. And similar to Southeast Asia, what Carson just mentioned, this is a great distraction in many cases. Um, and you can, you can probably compare that with crime on land when, for example, the police in any city is not very concerned about drug-related offenses, for example. These crimes do not appear in official statistics, but then a new mayor gets elected or a new governor comes in and he has that very high on his political agenda. Um, so the police then cracks down on the problem and gets, gets much more active when it comes to drug-related crimes and that um, then, of course, shows up in the official statistics, but it, you, you kind of think that there's a massive problem now, but that doesn't mean that the problem didn't exist beforehand in the first place. So it was always there, but it's much more visible now. And the same can be shown or can be seen in, in this respect. Um, and that also leads to my second point, because having these reliable statistics in the first place is a very, very important step and probably the most important step to finding actual solutions. So when we're looking at attacks against ships, um, we must carefully analyze individual incidents. Um, that's important for shipping companies, of course, and for seafarers who are, are directly impacted, but it's also important for navies and law enforcement agencies. And especially when you consider that many of these agencies are not particularly well-funded across 
many African countries. So they have very limited financial and human resources. Um, so they really have to use the assets that they have in the most um, proficient manner. And to illustrate these points, um, I just wanted to have a look at two case studies. And that's really why I wanted to have a presentation because that makes sense to actually show you. Um, not every case that is reported as piracy definitely involves a ship that was randomly targeted. And there have been this year alone, several reports about, for example, attacks against tankers, um, all types of tankers. And they had a history of frequently switching off their automatic identification system, um, AIS in short. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with these maritime acronyms, this, that is a system which is used to track and identify ships at sea, very broadly speaking. Um, many countries that do not have coastal radar stations or any sort of capacities for aerial surveillance or satellite surveillance, so um, they have to rely on tracking ships based on this AIS system. Um, and that means that maritime agencies very often simply do not know what is actually going on off their coast because when these ships um, turn off AIS, they simply go dark. Um, and the problem is that you can really easily switch off AIS when you're on the ship. Um, although there are very few actually good reasons to do that. So when it happens repeatedly, that's not an actual proof of any wrongdoings, but it certainly raises at least some red flags and it, it, it warrants a further investigation. Now this incident that you can see here involves the arena, which was uh, a tanker and that was reported just a few weeks ago. Um, this is a bunkering tanker. So that means it supplies other ships with fuel, but that fuel may be legitimate or it may have been stolen or it may have been smuggled. So there are all kinds of things in between. The crew actually reported an attack, but once again, the AIS in this case was actually switched off. And in, in this area, particularly off Western Central Africa, that's often done deliberately to avoid being tracked, as I just mentioned. Um, there are investigations ongoing in this case. And as usual, they are often complicated because there's a lack of transparency by shipping companies, by charterers, by insurers, and by all sorts of other stakeholders. Um, and in this case, that, that is not going to be very different. So um, it's really important for coastal countries like Nigeria in this case, but also other countries in the region to have better surveillance measures um, so that they are not just reliant on AIS data and also on statements by the crew who may not be the most reliable witnesses in these cases. There's also other cases where crew members were kidnapped, were actually kidnapped from locally, tri locally trading cargo ships. And, and this is an example involving the Rio Mitong and the Jibloho in, uh, in May this year. Now, um, similar to quite a couple of other incidents, this was widely reported in not only in the shipping media, but also um, in the general media um, as yet another piracy attack involving the kidnapping of seafarers from a ship or from two ships in this case. But when such cases are likely linked or at least likely linked to other illicit activities or to criminal disputes or similar things, it makes a difference for law enforcement agencies. And it, it also makes a difference for shipping companies because they need a realistic assessment when it comes to mitigation efforts. Now, in this particular incident, both of these ships, they were attacked off uh, Bioko Island, which is part of Equatorial Guinea. Now, both of these ships are linked to a company which is ultimately controlled by a businessman from Lithuania, um, and his name is Vladimir Stefanov. Based on a couple of investigations, actually, and court cases, uh, this Mr. Stefanov has pretty close ties to Equatorial Guinea's government, namely to the president himself and to his son. Uh, Mr. Stefanov is also quite involved in a uh, network of companies which are registered in various countries where transparency may not be very high on the agenda. Um, and many of these companies have been linked to uh, corruption and money laundering and embezzlement and all these fun activities. Now, at Risk Intelligence, at my day job, we're not actually conducting criminal investigations. So we cannot say that there have been any illegal activities for sure. However, this case, um, I think, looks very different from a case where a ship is randomly attacked and seafarers are kidnapped and then later released when the ransom has been paid. So this level of analysis highlights that piracy 
in very broad terms should not be seen in a vacuum um, because as I said earlier, this is merely one symptom of transnational organized crime um, and that's quite widespread across the region and involves a lot of different kinds of activities. And again, that relates to what Carsten just said about Southeast Asia because that's very much the case here as well. So this is just a very short list of some of these illicit activities and I don't have to dive into the details here, but the main point is that we're not only talking about drugs or weapon smuggling, um, like many agencies would like to believe, but about legal products, which have pretty astounding profit margins in many cases. Um, that includes timber smuggling, um, which is estimated by UNODC, for example, to be about a $9 billion a year business just in Africa alone. Um, and the largest part of that timber comes from Western Central Africa. Now that kind of money can buy you quite a lot of political protection in countries where the GDP is not very high to begin with. Um, so there's a lot of influential businessmen and politicians that have been actually linked to this kind of business. And the same is true for fuel and for other oil products. Um, it's also a business that's worth several billions of dollars a year in the region alone. Um, and there are other things that are also lucrative, but at the same time, they're quite dangerous and of course destructive. Um, that's smuggled pharmaceuticals, including fake drugs, for example. Um, it also includes illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, massive problem across the region, um, as in other, other regions of, around the world as well. Um, and it, it doesn't necessarily mean that there are direct links between all of them, um, but there are certainly some links um, between some of these things and none of them can be addressed in isolation. And that's the main point. Um, there have been actually good discussions between governments in the region, and they have started to address all of these issues and more, not just those that I just talked about. Um, a couple of years ago in the Yaoundé Code of Conduct, which is a political document that was adopted in 2013, so seven years ago, without going into the details, this document is concerned with all kinds of maritime security issues, which you can see listed here. So these are all the things that are specifically mentioned in that document. Um, and governments actually know that they must tackle those um, to get to sustainable improvements. There are a lot of other stakeholders like listed here, maritime industry very broadly and also international partners, um, very broadly speaking. And they're all from outside the region. Um, they are also concerned about maritime security, but by and large, they only care about specific aspects. Um, again, this is a much longer discussion probably, but it makes it very complicated to align external funding for specific programs or projects with regional efforts and regional priorities. And the main problem, I think, is that sustainable improvements take a long time. And it gets even more complicated when you think about COVID-19 and also the impact of relatively low oil prices, um, specifically on government budgets, because they are going to have a lot of different priorities in the coming years. And it's very unlikely that navies or other maritime agencies are going to have a lot more money to, uh, to work with. So that's, of course, not um, it's quite good news for my own job security, of course, um, but it makes it even more important to have a, a comprehensive analysis and, and um, a comprehensive solutions to different criminal activities. And um, so I think even though the, the global initiative had actually done some good work in that aspect, um, there's a lot more to be done. And um, I would like to offer this as a suggestion to Tuesday. Um, but other than that, um, I think there's a, there's a lot of very, very good work already being done. So um, with that in mind, thank you very much for the invitation and allowing me to present in this forum. And uh, thank you very much to you, say, and back to you. Thank you, Dirk, and thank you very much, first of all, for taking the initiative to host the panel, which I think is going very well and also is very interesting and timely and important. And I think we would certainly recognize as an organization uh, the little bit of a lacuna in terms of analysis and knowledge generation and sharing around maritime crime and maritime dynamics and would be very happy to take up what I heard as an offer to help us fill that. So <laughs> let's talk afterwards. And I certainly um, with, with a wry smile also did note the point that uh, none of us are going out of business anytime soon and that fortunately uh, for those of us who work in transnational organized crime, but unfortunately in the broader pictures. So, I mean, the fight continues. Um, before he falls asleep on us, <laughs> for Christian Ehrlich out in Mexico. Uh, Christian, it's brilliant to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Uh, comments on the Gulf of Mexico to you. 
Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, good morning to everyone. It's uh, three o'clock in the morning here in Mexico. So let me just begin. Can you see my um, PowerPoint uh, now? Great. So I was tasked with talking to you about uh, piracy in, in Mexico. Uh, but before that, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm both a consultant and also I do some sort of academic uh, work. I'm the founding partner and director of intelligence at RISCOP, which is a risk intelligence company based in Monterrey, Mexico, which is in the north of the country, pretty close to, to the US. And we provide, uh, we have provided over the past 10 years, um, field collected intelligence, uh, both for private companies and also uh, government agencies. And right now I'm conducting a also, how to say it, some research on maritime security and new types of, of conflict in, in terms of, of my academic um, research. And I am way, way behind Derek. I'm not doing a PhD right now, but a maritime uh, security master's degree at, at Coventry. And well, the first question here is, uh, is, is the Gulf of Mexico uh, a international hotspot in terms of, of piracy? Well, it depends on, on who you ask. Um, no one really cared about Mexico in terms of piracy until let's say the past 12 months or so when some international media outlets began to, to raise uh, the issue and only afterwards uh, Mexican newspapers and Mexican uh, news companies began to to look at the at the, at the issue they they never did it before uh, the new york times uh came up with this uh news and that was on april i think and it, it said piracy surges in the gulf of mexico prompting u.s warning because uh the u.s government made an international warning in last uh june and it it uh, uh, drew international attention but it, it depends on who you ask, and this is all about uh, perspectives. But before I, I talk to you about piracy in, in Mexico, I would like to, to explain a little bit uh, about Mexico's maritime domain, which is quite big and, and, and complex. Uh, there are uh, critical sea lines of communications, both on the Pacific and on the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, if you can see here, on the Pacific, there's a lot of traffic coming from East Asia and the Western part of the US going southwards to, to Panama to get to the Caribbean. But on the Gulf of Mexico, uh, you see mostly uh, oil and gas uh, related activities, uh, particularly here where you can see my, my mouse. That's uh, that part uh, which is called um, the Campeche Basin is full with uh, oil and gas uh, related industry. And exactly there is where some piracy acts uh, have taken place over the past uh, months. Uh, Mexico's maritime domain is quite big. It's 3 million square kilometers of exclusive economic zone. Actually, Mexico's uh, exclusive economic zone is bigger than our land uh, territory. We have more than 11,000 kilometers of coastlines and we have sea borders to the US, Cuba, Guatemala and, and Belize. <clears throat> but more specifically on the Gulf of Mexico in, in terms of maritime security challenges, uh, I can see uh, three main uh, issues going on here. Um, growing piracy and armed robbery at sea, uh, oil and gas resources, as I told you before, there are more than 250 uh, oil platforms uh, close to the coast of Mexico. And there's also an increasing presence of Chinese oil and gas uh, companies in, in the region. But I will not talk about it right now because it, it doesn't have anything to do with, with piracy, at least not now. And, and you have two competing visions on this issue. On the left, you have, uh, on the one hand, you have people and, and the media and some NGOs saying that uh, piracy is on the rise and uncontrolled in Mexico. You have information from organizations such as Stable Seas, which is a very, very uh, serious and, and, and great uh, NGO. But sometimes uh, its, its sources are not that um, good. Like in, in, in this place in particular, the International Federation of Maritime Workers established that uh, an average of 16 attacks per month take place uh, in the Gulf of Mexico in terms of piracy and armed robbery at sea and they reported it to, to a stable seas. 
Um, you have also the Mexico's merchant, merchant marine sector. Um, they don't have a good relationship with the Navy. I will talk about it later. And they provided that information to the IFM and to stable seas. So in, in my opinion, uh, although we have a, a very interesting situation going on right there, you cannot say that 16 attacks per month is a realistic uh, figure, it, it, it's, it's not. Um, you have also the international media, as I said before, um, covering um, the Italian flagship incident, this, this ship, the OSV Remas or Remas is an Italian flagship that was attacked uh, two times. First on November last year, shots were fired one member of the crew had to be evacuated by helicopter by the Mexican Navy. And the ship was again attacked this year on April. So uh, the international media came and say, hey, what's going on in Mexico? And it uh, prompted the US government to issue a threat alert uh, this, this year. But, you know, uh, I asked the, the Navy, what is going on in Mexico? Uh, do you have official figures about this? And they do have some, some figures. And as my colleagues said before, there are lots of incidents that, that go un, unreported. And the Navy somehow managed to get uh, data, both from, of course, uh, the Naval Intelligence Service and also from other uh, coastal and the local police, et cetera, about what is going on in, in the region. And they told me that uh, so far between 2018 and August to 2020, there has been uh, 45 incidents so far. And you, you must also uh, remember that uh, there's going on some political reform uh, in Mexico um, when the civilian authorities that uh, for over the past 40 years controlled the ports in Mexico, it's no longer that case. They, they had to give the Navy that control and those, those civilian authorities and the merchant marines that will be part of the Navy Secretariat uh, in the next month or from the next month, uh, they, they mistrust the Navy and they may be uh, saying that the piracy situation in the region is, is uh, worse than it really is. Uh, and the Navy also accepts that there is a lack of resources, maritime domain awareness systems, ships and, and helicopters. So what we do know uh, so far, um, also in risk of, uh, we, we, we've been analyzing this issue and so far we don't see a relationship in between these uh, uh, groups and the organized crime that operates in the region or at least not related to Mexico's main uh, organized crime syndicates that operate in the area, which is the Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generacion and the Cartel de los Zetas. And they, they are not uh, moving into this business so far. It, it's mostly local families, coastal communities, but with the help sometimes uh, of active Pemex personnel. Pemex is Mexico's uh, oil and gas uh, state-owned monopoly. And as uh, Carson said before, uh, since 2000, 18, uh, Pemex has been suffering a lot of, of uh, financial problems and this unemployment provoked in the region is uh, certainly uh, provoking the people to, to go to the, to the seas and commit this as armed robberies. Uh, it, it, they somehow use uh, a two boat cell uh, scheme acting late at night and mostly between six nautical miles and 12 nautical miles of the coast. So in terms of uh, international uh, concept, uh, you cannot label this as piracy, but armed robbery at sea. Although to me, it's actually the same phenomenon. Oil theft is an exception. It's not as big as, as it, it might be, but uh, it, it should be treated differently. Uh, the Mexican Navy lacks enough, res uh, lacks enough resources to tackle this. They have this uh, forward operating base on a, a former oil platform in the Gulf of Mexico, but it's, it has proven to be uh, insufficient to tackle this issue. But the main situation here is the mistrust between the Navy and the civilian maritime security community. So, uh, so far we, we don't have an international crisis here, but we do have a growing maritime security concern. 
So what, what must be done? First, acknowledge the problem. Um, I, I have the feeling that the Mexican government doesn't really see this as a growing concern. Maybe the Navy, but the rest of the government doesn't, doesn't see it. Uh, there has to be a comprehensive dialogue between uh, the different maritime security stakeholders, the Navy, the shipping industry, also the, the fishing local communities there because they, they know the pirates because piracy is a land uh, originated threat. It doesn't originate on the sea. So the, the local communities on the coast, they, they pretty know much who is the pirate there. Uh, define a clear, realistic, desired end state. So uh, desired a strategic objective, define a strategic objective. It, it should be realistic in terms of financial capabilities and also in terms of of uh, means capabilities. Uh, it, afterwards, uh, there has to be defined specific projects. And I would like to say that it's, it's better to design less enthusiastic yet uh, achievable projects instead of a plethora of unachievable ones. And, and there has to be uh, a definition of a comprehensive multi-stakeholder government uh, governance structure, sorry, that, that serves two purposes. On the one hand, it facilitates information sharing between the maritime security community. And on the other, it reinforces the idea that piracy and maritime security require the efforts of both authorities and the entire maritime security as well. Strategic challenges here for a hypothetical counter piracy strategy. First, Mexico lacks a maritime culture whatsoever. So if you ask uh, the political elites, they don't really see the oceans as uh, a strategic landscape. Um, they, they don't really think about it. And it, it further complicates any uh, strategy regarding to the sea. And the same happens to a specific counterparty strategy in the region. I call it political sea blindness. And um, I think that raising political awareness first uh, would definitely require a strategy of its own before uh, defining a specific counter piracy strategy. Thank you very much. Sorry, I wasn't quite as quick on my mute button on my unmute button this time. Thank you, Christian, very much for that very interesting presentation. Um, and also laying out, I think, some of the questions around responses, which is, of course, the priority, at least as far as we're concerned, for where this conversation has to go. Um, we're going to open to some of the questions in the chat, though, frankly, I'm going to use the chair's privilege because I want one, too. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I'm interested across the three of your presentations, Carson alluded a little bit to the economic downturn generating increasing piracy incidents as people look essentially for opportunism, opportunistically to replace livelihoods. Um, both Dirk and Christian, in your presentation, you referred to, of course, attacks on oil facilities. I mean, the, in the post-COVID or the COVID cycle that we're going through now, oil prices dropping dramatically, incomes dropping dramatically. These are two, I think, perhaps opposing forces on the maritime crime space. I'd be really interested to hear your reflections on that. And then uh, you each have a question in the chat, if you take a look. I know we've been reading as we go. So what I might do is offer my question and then give you each five minutes to respond each to a question from the chat in your response, if that's okay. Uh, Carsten, it's been a while, so I'll go back to you first. Thanks, Tuesday. Um... Yeah, that's true. With the decrease in fuel prices, it simply just doesn't it doesn't have an appealing rate of return in terms of that risk ratio for some of these boarding team leaders who are really the, the ones who call the shots. Um, in the COVID era, there's there's still this there's an interest to hijack, but they're certainly wanting to have that lower risk. And so that's where you see this. Uh, no MGO, no MDO, which is marine gas oil or marine diesel oil. Let's focus on the crude palm oil. Low risk, typically an underpaid, corruptible uh, Indonesian police guard that would be on that vessel. And you could easily overpower them or pay them off, which is even better because they want to avoid all forms of violence. And it's 
selling quite high right now, CPO, the crude, the crude palm oil. So that would be a lucrative product with relatively low risk. And Carson, sorry, you have a question also to pick up in the chat that was directed at you and everybody else actually, but also you. Uh, where's it gone? Oh, chats. I think I, I, I went to answer it, but I sent it directly to someone and then I answered it generically, but ultimately yeah, no, it, the blend, <laughs> I think it was with respect to uh, what type of product is hitting the international markets. And crude palm oil, absolutely. Simply because Indonesian crude palm oil does have to go to Malaysia for refinement. And typically you'll have that blending in the outer port limits where you can then just mix the stuff together. So that would be the most likely, but you, or there has been cases in the past where you'll see other fuels. But once you start refining fuels and you're getting it down to select grades of marine diesel oil or marine gas oil, it's less likely, whereas crude palm oil is just so generic, it's super easy to just mash together and then ship it elsewhere. Thank you. Um, Dirk, I'm gonna to turn to you. You have a couple of questions as you've seen. Um, so feel free to ignore mine and pick up as many as you can in the questions that we already have. I'll start with, with yours very quickly first. Um, we actually, we wrote a white paper on the on COVID-19 and the impact on maritime security threats in general. And, and basically, and this is not only true for West Africa, but in general, it doesn't really have an impact, at least an immediate impact on um, threat levels around the world. And it's, it's very much too early to assess how that is going to play out. But what it does have is an impact, of course, on the tourism industry, which is a massive impact in many countries. Mexico, for example, being a, a, a good example, I think Christian can, can maybe relate to that. And if you, if you wipe out the tourism industry in many countries basically overnight, and that's going to have a longer term impact on job security, on GDP, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, it will have an impact on government budget, as I said earlier. So, I mean, there's not going to be a lot more money to be spent on maritime issues because that's very invisible, happens at sea. Um, why would you want to address any anything maritime related when you have to address the health sector first and then economic recovery first? Um, so is there more money going to be spent on navies, on other maritime agencies? Probably not. So what the longer term impact is uh, remains to be seen, but it certainly doesn't help with better law enforcement at sea, I think. Um, that also relates to the first question that was um, about IUU fishing, so illegal under, uh, unreported and unregulated fishing, um, because uh, it's, it's been said that is a very um, invisible crime. Um, and when I see the, the, the question, do you have any observations of why that may be the case and suggestions of what we as a community could do to change that? Well, I, um, there's a couple of suggestions. It's a longer discussion, but I think in general, the first problem is that it's very, as I said, invisible. It happens at sea, vessels coming, take fish and, and leaving. So it's not something that is immediately visible. It obviously has an impact on coastal communities and all sorts of other people. Um, but it, it doesn't really affect governments, it doesn't really affect anybody in, in the short term. So in, in, in many ways, it's kind of a perfect crisis because it's very long term. Um, there's always something that has to be addressed um, much more urgently, whereas IU fishing takes place, um, it just is there and, and that's the problem. So. Um, to make it more visible, I think it makes sense to put a number on it um, for countries to come up with something. I've been arguing for this um, for a long time to have like a maritime business plan and to say, you know, this is the kind of money that um, everything maritime related brings in. Um, so fishing has that kind of impact on our GDP, on local jobs, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And the same for maritime trade and for other things. And then based on that, you can say, oh, you know, it makes sense to spend X amount of money on, on navies, on maritime enforcement agencies, um, because we will actually make more money um, by providing this kind of level, level of security. And it's actually marketable. And by doing that, by spending that money now, we are going to have more money to spend on schools and roads and hospitals in two, three, four years time. Um, so I think make it make it more visible and, and just put a number on it. And, and that's, um, I think, one very important step. Um, there's also one question. I don't want to address that right now, but I, I would like to get in touch directly afterwards. Um, one question about 
relations between East and West Africa. I think that's, again, a slightly longer discussion, um, but feel free to send me an email um, with the same question. I'd be happy to get, uh, to get back to you on, uh, on this. Um, and I don't want to take too much time, so uh, leave some time for Christian. Thank you. Thank you, Dirk. Uh, Christian. Yeah, there are two. I, have, I have, there are two or three, three questions um, yeah. in regard to yes. Mexico. But first, uh, Antonia Gambinari is asking me, why uh, do the pirates risk operating between six to 12 nautical miles and not venture uh, going further? I think that it's uh, because they know that they can do it. They are aware that the Mexican Navy lacks enough resources to actually locate uh, and track and, and capture them. So it's a matter of, of naval resources. Uh, Stefano Betti is asking me um, if there is a link between uh, the alleged corruption within Pemex and the various episodes of onshore oil theft. Uh, of course there is. As I said before, um, it's, it's a matter of, everybody knows that uh, Pemex is a highly corrupt company. And yes, uh, they are also involved in this, uh, not in all of these incidents, but in, in some of them. And also, I think I have another question here by Lies Texeria. Is my question is for Christian, you mentioned that it's not traditional mafia style groups. Is it going to evolve into something more <laughs> complicated? That's a tough question. I, I don't really know. It may be the case. Uh, I think it is a matter of time. Uh, I think that uh, although the Navy may start looking at this issue uh, more, let's say more specifically, uh, the country is very big, as I said before. And I think that it is just a matter of time that uh, other parts of Mexico, uh, coastal parts of Mexico will begin to suffer this kind of events in the, in the coming future. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Christian. That's great, great answer, and I think very clear. So um, I, I see one, Doug, that you didn't answer. If you want, if you want to, or if you'd rather push that one off. Yeah, there was one on uh, uh, what we can learn on. I'm just reading um, what we can learn on trafficking, <laughs> people smuggling, etc. In terms of Europe, so a question from from the Netherlands, from the Middle East. Um, so. Um, what we can learn in terms of addressing various maritime crimes or maritime issues, I think, um, I mean, first of all, of course, European police forces have very different kinds of resources and very different kinds of opportunities compared with certainly Western Central Africa, but I'm, I think it's not a big stretch to say certainly compared with Southeast Asia or, or Mexico and, and other Caribbean countries as well. So um, that's one thing. I think what... Um, I mean, what certainly navies are not very good at, and I think to a, to a large degree, that's also for police forces, law enforcement agencies, the case. Um, they're not particularly good at analyzing things that are sort of outside of their purview. So any navy is good at doing naval stuff and, and analyzing that, but they're not very good at analyzing um, IEU fishing or um, people smuggling or things like that, which are not tra traditionally naval things. Um, and the same goes for police. They're good at fighting crimes on land and they may be good at organizing, um, at, at, at looking at that and, and doing assessments, analysis, etc. cetera. Um, but they don't have any traditional um, links to other organizations, to sort of maritime stakeholders, maritime, maritime insurers, shipping industry, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, So just um, trying to have better cooperation, coordination, um, making sure that um, you have maybe liaison officers or people who are actually very familiar with these things because it actually, it, it does help. I mean, for example, shipping companies are very concerned about, particularly about drug smuggling, of course, from South America to Europe. Um, there have been ships detained in ports for a very long time. So they are very keen on actually working with um, law enforcement agencies on what they can actually do to address the problem. And if they have that problem, where do they actually report to? Where do they get in, in touch with? Um, so uh, to a large degree, it's, it's knocking down open doors, but um, it, somebody has to make these connections. And I think that's very often um, missing, unfortunately. Thanks, uh, Dirk. If there are any more questions coming in, we have uh, 
have a couple of more minutes before the panel closes. Uh, I mean, I was, I'd like to pick up, I think, on two things that you said, and again, open this up to the panel. Firstly, it would be interesting to know from you guys what, I mean, actually, how do naval, how do navies feel about the fact they're increasingly brought into a debate that is essentially a criminal justice issue, that they're increasingly seeing a responsibility to engage in crime uh, we, we've done a lot of analysis on how the use of the military and a militarization on land in the crime fighting domain comes with a degree of challenges. So uh, I would be interested to hear whether you feel that the navies are facing a similar set of almost mandate crises or mission creep issues and whether or not there's the risk that we see on land that the it actually makes naval units more vulnerable when they become a, a long-term part of a crime fighting solution. Second of all, I mean, we've spoken of it, but it would be interesting to get your update again on the how the private sector is squaring up in this conversation. I mean, they've obviously, they're the targets, they hold a lot of burden in terms of ensuring their own safety and security. In the migrant debate, which we've just discussed um, briefly, they're of course also rescuing people at sea in the Mediterranean, which is of course not in the, in the geographic scope of any of your conversations we've had so far, but whether or not you're seeing also a, a sense of stress or a sense of proactivity from the private sector. Um, Carsten, can I go back to you? Yep, I'm here. Uh, that's a good question on the first front with uh, in terms of navies, because I look at three different examples. I'll, I'll look at, for example, there's Indonesia, which, and I, I don't mean to pick on Indonesia, but I'm more afraid of the Indonesian Navy than I am of Indonesian pirates, because I trust the pirates, but I don't know what the Navy's going to do to me if I find something out that they don't want me to find out. So there you have it. There you have a direct involvement in, 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 enabling uh, transnational maritime crimes. Then you look at Thailand where they were involved with the Rohingya and how they tried to manage that, which was way over their head. And I'd say that that was a failed policy. You look at the Malaysian Maritime Enforcement Agency, their Coast Guard, and how when they were born, uh, which I believe was 2007 or 2006, the Malaysian Marine Police just gave them all the old, terrible vessels, and they were forced to take on this entire mandate. I would say they've done an incredible job, but it was certainly a challenge. And the cooperation component with Marine Police go three miles out, Malaysian Maritime Enforcement Agency goes, well, technically 200, but don't go too far because that's when the Malaysian Navy wants to get involved as well. So then you have these jurisdictional interagency issues. Uh, and ultimately, you look at cases like Singapore, where their police coast guard really doesn't have much to do in their little area. And honestly, I haven't really seen them conduct very many arrests in that sense. So, yeah, it's a bit of a bit of a whirlwind in Southeast Asia and the literal states in terms of who does what and what's overwhelming for them or who's actually involved on the wrong side of the law. The second question was with respect to private stakeholders. And ultimately, there has been a lot more involvement with uh, like BIMCO, Intertanko, uh, for example, those uh, associations that are getting involved directly with Interpol in Southeast Asia and Singapore and doing intelligence sharing or information sharing, and also being more involved in recap, which is, which is actually a positive step because I think the private stakeholder sector is extremely valuable. They have information, they have intelligence, they have experience, and they can apply that. And again, you're not dealing with those face-saving issues or a lack of cooperation. Recap, for example, doesn't get along with Malaysia and Indonesia. And that's odd because Malaysia and Indonesia take up most of the coastline. So you'd want to have that, that strong progressive relationship. Uh, and that's where the International Maritime Bureau comes in because ultimately the IMB does have an excellent stakeholder relationship with, um, with the private sector. Um, yeah, if you say, you want me to go? To, okay. Um, 
Yeah, so first question, I think I, it's a very interesting question actually about the how navies are getting involved in, in sort of Coast Guard issues or traditional Coast Guard issues. And um, for, I mean, especially for my region, um, I think across Western Central Africa, there's a lot of naval personnel that are quite happy to deal with these things. But then again, they probably always knew that they are not going to be in a traditional Navy role, similar to sort of NATO countries, for example. Um, they are in most cases more uh, in, a, in, a, in a Coast Guard role anyway, and they have always been, and, and that's the kind of um, assessment equi equipment that they have, etc. Um, so it's a bit of a different situation. Going back to, for example, Somali piracy, it was never going to be the best use of um, warships that are worth several hundreds of millions of dollars to fight against um, small skiffs in the Indian Ocean. Um, because that's not really a traditional naval role, um, so that was kind of kind of a weird thing. Um, but it, it, it also had some some other backgrounds as well, of course. Um, so I think for uh, Western Central Africa in general, um, it's not something that is completely unheard of or, or, or bad. I think um, to a large degree, these countries have been working together much better over the past couple of years, and that's why you see increasing numbers of incidents, as I mentioned, incidents involving local cargo vessels, fishing vessels, and those wouldn't have even part, been part of, of official statistics because you see a lot more transparency now. People are more concerned about this. So you actually see this, this reported. Um, and that's a good, um, similar to what Carson just said about Malaysia, there's a good anecdote from, from Ghana a couple of years ago, and this relates to the, the role of international partners because they are very often, they want to work with Coast Guards or similar agencies, and they don't want to work necessarily with navies. And a couple of years ago in Ghana, um, the Ghana Maritime Police was set up um, simply because they got funding, um, or the, the Ghanaian government got funding for Maritime Police, and they wouldn't have got the, the same funding for the Navy. And then the Maritime Police was set up completely without any sort of consultation with the Navy. And you can probably imagine that there were some frictions, to say it mildly, um, about jurisdictional issues, about who gets vessels, etc. Um, so it was quite complicated and it's working much better now, but that was not always the case. And that's very much based on the involvement of international partners, which is not very particularly helpful in, in, in very many cases. Um, and that's also a nice segue to uh, the, the second part or the, the second question, um, involvement of the private sector in general. And I would limit that to the shipping industry and, and partly to insurers. Um, and similar to what Carson said, I mean, shipping industries, of course, they have an interest in protecting their crews, protecting their cargoes, protecting their ships. Um, so they will always be very interested in that. Having said that, they have a very limited interest when it comes to maritime security because they are mostly interested with piracy, armed robbery, all these things that are directly targeting their ships. Um, they could not care less about IUU fishing. Um, and I think that's a fair point because that's not really their role to be involved in. So um, work with them and use them and, and that, that all makes sense, but also be sure that there are some limitations and there are, uh, there's a limited amount of things that, that different companies, for example, are involved in. Um, when you open up the private sector and you include, for example, non-government agencies like um, Sea Shepherd or Global Fishing Watch, they're really doing a good job when it comes to IEU fishing, but then that's what they're concerned with. Um, so it's important for navies to actually build these relationships with sort of other stakeholders in very different areas. And these are very much non-traditional stakeholders um, and very much non-traditional partnerships. And that, I think that makes a lot of sense, but um, that's not going to happen overnight because these are things that um, building trust and all of these things, that takes a lot of time, of course. Uh, thank you, Dirk. Useful comments. And there's an appeal, I think, from one of our audience, Vincent, who uh, would like very much to continue this conversation afterwards. So he's left you his email. Um, Christian. Yes. Are you uh, functioning? Yes, I am. I've been experiencing <laughs> some internet issues here, but I think I'm back. Uh, Daniel is asking me about sea blindness. Um, Sea blindness is not a technical issue, it's a political one. It's a, it's a matter of uh, the political elites of, of the countries uh, in, in understanding the importance of the sea. 
If they do so, they will do whatever it takes to allocate uh, financial and technical resources to understand what is happening on the sea. So sea blindness is a consequence of something broader, which is of the lack of a strategic vision in regard to the sea. And it, it relates to the other question in, in regarding the Gulf of California. And I, I have the same answer. Uh, since uh, there is uh, no uh, maritime culture in the nation, uh, I, I do believe that it will be quite difficult for the Mexican Navy, which is Mexico's sole and unique uh, maritime enforcement agency. I know it's a Navy, but we do not have a constabulary force here. It's, it's all on the, on the Mexican Navy. It will be very difficult uh, to them to actually uh, tackle all the, the issues uh, related to maritime security uh, risks and threats around the country if uh, the government and the political elites doesn't understand, don't understand, sorry, the importance of the sea. And I don't see that happening in the, in the near term. Thank you, Tuesday. Thank you uh, very much, Christian. We have four minutes left <laughs> in our panel before we have to close. So what I'd like to propose, if you don't mind, is I'll go back to you in reverse order to give, uh, actually I'll hold Dirk for last, so we'll go to back to Christian, then to Carsten, then to Dirk, for your last one minute wrap up, summary, takeaway, appeal to for further action. What do you want this panel to be remembered? What do you want to be remembered from this panel in your concluding remarks, please? Uh, Christian, back to you. Yeah, thank you, Jesus, and thank you everybody for, for your time. And well, I, would, I just want to say that um, the maritime security environment is quite uh, complex uh, and it, it, it needs to be uh, fully analyzed uh, and, and understood in order to, to come up with fresh ideas. And the only way to do that is by having this sort of strategic conversations more and more and more. Uh, crime happens on the sea as well as on land, but uh, I think that uh, idea should be more broadly, uh, I don't know, expanded. Thank you, Tuesday, and thank you, everybody. Thank you, Christian, and thank you for staying up with us um, to, to do this. To our other sleep deprived uh, panelists, Carson, to you. Uh, if I were to echo Christian, I would say that um, follow the money and you will end up on land. So we know that there are those connections. I would say that in Southeast Asia, piracy is cyclical. So we may have our, you know, 2000 slump and all of a sudden we get some more action and then all of a sudden it slumps again and we can be prepared to see more reported cases of hijacking for product theft. And finally, I would say that Pirates are actually not pirates. They're just doing a piracy tactic as part of maritime organized crime. And the thing to remember about maritime organized crime is that it's like water. It's going to find the path of least resistance and continue to conduct its operations. It's not just going to stop. It's just going to diversify and work the easiest route. So yeah, thank you very much for, for having me. And it was great to be with Christian and, uh, and Dirk as well. Thank you, Carson. It was great to have you too. And Dirk, brainchild of our panel, wraps up. I'm, I'm, not going to add, I'm not going to add any wise words to uh, those much wiser words that Christian and Carson already said. So I'm uh, absolutely underlining everything they just said and, and that's very much the case. Um, I just uh, wanted to have a very quick summary of this panel and I thought it would make sense um, to have a look at different regions which have different, some different issues. Um, which have some different organizations, some different capacities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I also think it makes sense to look across these regions and um, for them to learn from each other. And also for sometimes for outsiders, for example, the Global Initiative is a really a good, a good organization to do that, to encourage that kind of um, learning lessons from each other, making introductions in, in some cases and just making sure that that actually happens. And I hope um, this panel is one tiny step on uh, achieving that. And uh, Chief, so feel free to uh, take me up on my offer earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I love a panel with some follow-up action. So we will look for indeed for a greater facilitation of this kind of conversation. I do hope that everybody in our audience found it useful. So um, 
they will also be keen to participate and see what comes from a collaboration. Thank you again to our three panelists, Karsten, Christian and Dirk, for your insights into the maritime crime dynamics in your region. Thank you for the wide ranging set of ideas and experience that you've shared with everybody. Um, thank you to all of our volunteers and our stream managers who have kept us on track and kept everything running smoothly. And finally, thank you all very much to everyone who joined us in this session. And I hope I'll see you in another room in the next session. Enjoy your 15 minute break, guys. And thanks again.